Hi, welcome everyone. Um, and Allison, would you be able to mute while I do the intro? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, well, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr, and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, the EBM Tools Network for short. Uh, the EBM Tools Network is co coordinated by NatureServe and OpenChannels.org. And with me today, I have Nick Weiner uh, from OpenChannels.org, who is helping to uh, co moderate this webinar. Um, uh, we're very pleased to have here right now Vipul Prasad and Allison Kaufman from uh, Digital Globe, and they're going to be demonstrating the Digital Globe Insight Explorer Marine Mapping Program and its IUU fishing applications. Um, we're very pleased they can be with us today, so welcome. Um, and before we get started, I'll turn it over to them in a second. I wanted to let everyone, let everyone know how to ask questions. There are two ways to ask questions. You can type the questions into the question panel of the user interface. Um, and then I will relay the question to Allison and Vipple. Um, you can send those questions in at any point throughout the presentation um, and the Q&A period. Um, if there are short substantive questions or short uh, or quick questions, clarifying questions, I um, might be able to um, ask the presenters to uh, answer them during the presentation, but more substantive questions will hold till the end. Um, but feel free to send them in at any point as you think of them. Uh, the other way to ask questions is to raise your virtual hand. There's a little hand icon in the user interface. You can raise your virtual hand and I'll unmute you and you can ask the question directly uh, to Allison and Vipul. This only works, however, if you have a working microphone or if you've called in to the if you call into the telephone conference line and you've entered the PIN number. Uh, but feel free to use this way of asking questions as well. So anyway, Allison Vipple, thank you very much for being with us today, and I'll turn it over to you now. Uh, so hi, my name is Allison, and I'm an oceanographer at Digital Globe in the Marine Services Department. And presenting with me today is Vipple Prasad, who is head of Marine Services. And today we're going to talk about our IU fishing solution. Oh, if it's not advancing, this okay, it is advancing. Okay, great. Uh, so Digital Globe is a satellite imagery company based out of Westminster, Colorado. We have over a thousand employees and offices worldwide. And we serve a variety of markets, including defense and intelligence agriculture, humanitarian, civil government, mining, and marine. And we have four satellites in our constellation right now. Uh, the four on the right are currently in commission, while the two on the left have been decommissioned. And we're working on launching our newest satellite, Worldview 4. And just to give you an overview of our department, um, Marine Services was launched in 1997 as a subscription service for commercial uh, fisheries worldwide. We're based out of Digital Globe's Herndon, Virginia office, and we receive data from NASA, NOAA, the Naval Research Laboratory, AWT, and Exact Earth. That data includes oceanographic and weather data that gets updated daily and is sent to our customers. Our team of in-house oceanographers also uses that data to create fishing recommendations for our customers as part of our subscription service. Also included in the subscription service is the Insight Explorer end user software, which allows users to view and analyze the data so that they can find the most productive fishing grounds and optimize their fishing operations. And on the right of the screen is, uh, are some examples of our data sets. On the top is plankton. Uh, followed by sea surface temperature, and on the bottom is sea surface height anomaly. Our other data sets include subsurface temperatures, sea and subsurface currents, thermocline depths, salinity, bathymetry, and weather. Okay, now we're just going to talk a bit about IU fishing. And there are three types of IU fishing, I for illegal, U for unreported and the other U for unregulated. Illegal fishing occurs when vessels from one country fish in the jurisdiction of a country without permit. Ah, 
Allison, your sound is flickering uh, in and out and is now just out in general. Um, Allison, can you hear us? Bipple, are you able to... Um... Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, she she might be having some problems with the headset. Okay. So let me ask her to switch, otherwise I'll take over. Okay. Okay, and, and she can resort to what she had used yesterday if she needs to. Sorry about that, folks. We'll uh, try and get Allison back in just a minute. So what I'll do is, while she's uh, reconnecting, I'll go through this uh, slide. Uh, can everyone hear me? I guess, uh, Sarah, can you confirm if you can hear me loud yes. and clear? Yes, I can. Okay. Sounds great. So this slide shows uh, the different kind of uh, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing uh, can happen around the world. So first, I, if we start from the top, if you're fishing in another country's uh, jurisdiction, which is an exclusive economic zone, Without a license, that's illegal fishing. Then if a vessel with a dual flag is fishing in somebody's EEZ, that's also illegal. Then each license, when you obtain a fishing license from a particular country, that's related to a particular species. So if you are fishing a species that you're not permitted to fish, that's also illegal fishing. Fishing, say, in a prohibited area, right at the center, if you can see, if a country has designated a particular area, like, you know, in Asia, like uh, a country like Indonesia, over 600 marine protected areas. And if you're fishing in an area which has been deemed as a marine protected area, that's illegal. So, uh, Sarah, I actually lost the slides as well. Can yes, you see Allison the slide? Yes, must have taken it off. I'm not sure if, uh, not sure if she's receiving any of our messages, but yeah, uh, no, we cannot see it either. Okay. okay. Do you, uh, you don't happen to have oh. a copy of the presentation by any chance, do you? I do, I do. Oh, you do, okay. But, right, but the okay. audience won't be able to, let me. Um, if, you, if you're able to share it, then we can uh, share it we can share your screen. Okay, let me do that. Everyone, we truly apologize for this. This is something we didn't anticipate. Let me open. Okay, and we're seeing the marine can services. You see the slides? Yes, we can, well, and they look great. That's perfect. that's perfect. Okay, great. Okay, just a second now. Okay. So uh, these were some of the types of illegal fishing. Now, unregulated, as you can imagine, unreported and unregulated. The words uh, really uh, define what they are. Unre Reported means if you're catching above your quota. So when you get a license from a particular country, you're assigned a certain quota. If you are going beyond the quota or catching something or a species that were not allowed, those are all unregulated uh, types of fishing. 
So I'll move to the next one. So this is, uh, these are some of the details from the last white paper that was published uh, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. All illegal fishing activity accounts for about 15 to 30 percent of all seafood production around the world. So that's a really, really high number, especially in Asia. I've been traveling to Asia a lot uh, over the last one year. And uh, Indonesia, and you'll see a slide um, uh, uh, later in the presentation, Indonesia and some of the other Asian countries are some of the most affected countries by this illegal uh, fishing. And normally the operators who are not catching the fish legally, they, their costs are normally lower than the ones who actually go on, obtain the license and do everything legally. So that's why the fish that is caught illegally obviously is in high demand because they can sell it at a lower price. And again, the labor that's used for illegal fishing, I can hear my echo back for some reason. Um, I think that's because Allison's back online. So. Uh, Allison, Allison, are you back in line? Yeah, sorry, I don't, I don't know what just happened. My whole computer just shut down and restarted itself. Okay, um, I'll uh, control the slides. We let this uh, slide uh, be on, and I'll control the slides. Uh, you can start presenting. That way, there won't be any echo. Is there, are you, so you have the screen up? Yes. Yeah, can, Allison, can you see Vipples? Can you see the slides? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. And, and Vipla cover, uh, covered the fishing by the numbers aspect. So I was on the second oh, point, profits. Oh, uh, prospects. Um, so while there have been international efforts to combat uh, IUU fishing in the past, um, the problem of IUU fishing has persisted because the demand for fish remains strong. Criminals tend to be adaptive, and because of the added stress to fish stocks from climate change. So the next slide. Uh, okay, uh, it has also the IU fishing has also persisted because it's an incredibly complex issue, and that makes it uh, really hard to resolve. So as I mentioned, there are the three types of IU fishing which do overlap. And it happens for a variety of reasons and can be made worse due to uh, many different factors. And it has a lot of far-reaching consequences. And all of these things tend to further the issue, so it's like a positive feedback loop where all of the impacts tend to fuel the issue. Because of this complex nature, uh, there's never going to be an all-encompassing solution to the IUU fishing problem. And at Digital Globe, we're interested in providing management authorities and end users with the technology needed uh, to fight against IU fishing and to maintain healthy fish stocks for a sustainable fishing future. Next. Um, I think you went, you've gone too far. Back, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I think you're missing a slide, but that's okay. We'll just go forward. Yeah, yeah, let's um, yeah, okay. So we're going to talk about now our um, our IU solution at Digital Globe. And earlier this year, Digital Globe and Exact Earth formed a strategic alliance to offer a joint solution to combat IU fishing. This partnership is unique as it brings together the power of AIS data, satellite imagery advanced geospatial uh, analytics, and object detection technology. Next. So our solution has uh, three main parts, and I'm just going to go through each one and explain how they work. Um, so AIS, or Automatic Identification System, is an automatic tracking system that's used on ships and by vessel traffic services for identifying and locating vessels by electronically exchanging data with other nearby ships, AIS base stations, and satellites. Our platform ingests AIS data that allows end users to monitor vessel behavior and will indicate when a vessel has infringed on a no-go zone. With this data, we can provide customized compliance reports. 
In the oceanographic data that we are already providing as part of our fishing services and using for fishing recommendations can be used to monitor oceanographic hotspots or ideal fishing grounds. This data can be used to inform management officials where illegal fishing may occur based on ideal environmental conditions. And satellite imagery can provide evidence towards catching a vessel engaged in IUU fishing. End users will be able to task and order satellite imagery for any area of interest to confirm any kind of IUU fishing activity. Additionally, fishing vessels equipped with communication devices can report any suspected criminal activity to management authorities. So it's like a crowdsourced IUU detection effort. Next. Um, this is the base version of our platform, and as we work with different countries, we can customize the platform to meet their specific needs. As you can see on the screen, we have the AAS data set displayed, uh, so you can see all the vessels that are fishing in the area. That's the, these like black boxes with the white text in them. And if you were to zoom in, you could see each vessel's tracks, and if you were to click on, the ve on any of the vessels, you could see its speed and other uh, information about that vessel. This information can help determine if that vessel is engaged in fishing or if it's just passing through the area. Uh, if the tracks are sort of like zigzagged, then it's likely engaged in some sort of fishing activity, uh, while if the tracks are fairly straight and moving at a higher speed, then it's likely just passing through. And the black lines around the coasts are the economic exclusive zones, or the EEZs. And authorities can see when a vessel is entering an EEZ if it's not licensed to fish in. Um, or if a vessel is fishing outside of an EEZ, if it's infringing on some sort of no-go zone or protected area, the local uh, regional fisheries management organization will be able to see that. Also displayed is some oceanographic data. This one is the surface temperatures. Our oceanographers can analyze this data along with historical oceanographic data, just like they do for uh, commercial fishing vessels, to monitor fishing uh, hotspots and find the most promising fishing grounds. This information will help authorities narrow down their areas of interest so that they can look for potential IUU fishing where it's most likely to occur based on the environmental factors. On the right side of the screen uh, is what we call our Mastercast tool. Uh, this is what we use to determine fishing grounds. It's a predictive analysis tool and it basically allows you to use known habitat preferences for any fish species and it will highlight areas on the screen that meet those habitat preferences. So for instance, um, you would enter the known preferred temperature range and maybe preferred plankton concentration range for any kind of fish species. Uh, and then you would enter those preferences into this range rules section. And when you click apply, the master cast layer would appear on the screen. And it would show up in any areas that meet those values specified in the range rules section. So for this example, the species of interest uh, prefers surface water temperatures between 29 and 30 degrees Celsius. And the master cast layer is this uh, white layer that's covering the sea surface temperature data. And any area underneath that master cast layer uh, has water temperatures between 10, 29 and 30 degrees Celsius. Um, next. Okay, and this is an example of a customized platform. And for management officials and monitoring authorities, we can customize the platform with geofences, which would allow users to draw a section on the screen to indicate protected areas or MPAs or areas that are close to fishing. Only the user can see the geofence. Fishing vessels cannot. So if a vessel enters an area that's close to fishing, the monitoring authorities can monitor that vessel's tracks to determine if it's just passing through or if it's engaged in fishing. And these heat spots, these like red, orange, yellow areas, um, that's just an extension of the Mastercast layer. Uh, but here it's called the hotspot layer. The red area is the area that most meets the habitat preferences set in the range rules. So it's the most ideal fishing grounds. And orange is ideal, but less so than the red, and the yellow even less so. Allowing authorities to use this tool helps them to focus on areas where vessels might be fishing protected species. Or if they turn on the hotspots layer and notice that it covers an area within their geofence, they'll know to focus on vessels passing through that area. We can also customize the platform to provide users with a means of tasking the satellite for imagery of a suspected IUU vessel. Next. 
Our high resolution satellite imagery is at 30, 30 centimeter resolution, which enables vessel identification. The satellites can be tasked to image at any location worldwide on demand. Next. And just to give you an example of how this works, our satellite imagery was used to identify the Silver Sea 2 as two smaller vessels were loading slave-caught fish onto the vessel. The Silver Sea 2 was a Thai-owned ship that was suspected to be fishing illegally, and the vessel was identified by the AP in July through Digital Globe's high-resolution imagery, which showed slave-caught fish being loaded onto the refrigerated vessel in Papua New Guinea's waters. The AP then tracked the ship through its satellite beacon and informed Indonesian authorities when it crossed into their waters on its way home to Thailand. And the AP later won the 2016 Pulitzer Prize for Public Service for this investigation, and obviously the enslaved fishermen were freed. Um, and that's about it. That's uh, pretty much our, our solution. Um, I think the next slide has our contact information for any questions or comments. Um, if you're unable to ask questions now. Okay, I'll make a couple of comments about satellite imagery. Uh, right now we are doing two uh, major experiments. One is uh, doing satellite imagery on all the transshipments that are happening. So we are tracking some transshipments, basically rendezvous based on AIS tracks and trying to capture some satellite imagery to see how uh, how much of an evidence we can get based on the imagery we get. Again, our satellites are all sub-meter resolution, so the uh, Worldview 3 satellite is 30 centimeters, and the one that we are going to launch in the next uh, few weeks, Worldview 4, is also going to be 30 centimeters. So using that satellite imagery, we can not only detect the activity, but we can possibly detect the vessel as well, or rather identify the vessel. And the second thing, or second effort we are undertaking is uh, uh, work on machine learning. So imagery that's uh, over ocean, we have a lot of uh, work that's gone into detecting vessels within the imagery. So if you can imagine there are thousands and thousands of square uh, imagery, thousands and thousands square, square kilometers of imagery and looking for vessels in that imagery is a tedious task. So uh, we have a lot of work that we've put in to automatically detect vessels, uh, separate vessels out from that imagery. So I guess uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, we'll open the floor for questions, and then uh, anyone is welcome to write to either me or Allison as well. OK, great. Thank you, guys. Um, so a, a question that came in during the presentation, how good is the master cast at predicting where target fish will be? Um, how often are the target species in the area predicted by the master cast? Is it 100% of the time, 50% of the time? Do you collect data on this? Allison, do you want to take that one? She's the oceanographer. That's why I'm. Um, yeah. So we don't actually. I mean, we don't actually have like a success rate. Um, that's not necessarily known. We don't really get co uh, complaints from our customers, um, and when we do, they're few and far between. Um, but uh, the mastercast and. Um, these fishing recommendations, that's based off of uh, endless amounts of research. Um, mostly research that, you know, we find whether online or in books or whatever, um, our customers aren't always uh, that into giving up, like, any kind of catch reports for us to use to inform MasterCast. Um, but for the most part, uh, we, we don't really have that many complaints from our customers. so. Uh, from what we can get, and they continue to use our service. So from what we can gather, they're, they're relatively happy with uh, the recommendations, so they must be fairly successful. And okay. I'll just add one example to that. So uh, recently, we had a trial going on in Vietnam. Now, we didn't have any customers in Vietnam before. So the first customer, or uh, this was a company who was uh, interested in buying tuna uh, from Vietnam. So they wanted to 
equip the vessels with some technology and see if they can make the fleet more efficient so that they can uh, get some supply uh, uh, matching their demand. So the first time they used our service, the very first day, they caught nine times more fish than they caught without the service. It's not to say that every time you use our service, you'll catch nine times the more, you know, nine times the regular catch, but what I'm saying is it is proven over a long time that this is a very, very effective tool in predicting where uh, the probability of having fish HC is maximum. Not where the fish is, but the probability of having fish is maximum. Okay. Can you describe prices um, for the service? Um, including for just the regular fishery service as well as for IUU fishing? Okay, so for uh, the fishery service, it depends on the type of vessel that's uh, using the service. So we charge based on the capacity of the vessel. So smaller vessels typically, I mean coastal vessels, they typically get charged uh, $500 a month but that's for a very small coastal vessel and then the prices go up. If you're a big person vessels, uh, if you're a big person vessel then you pay a lot more than 500. But for IUU, again, it's a customized service. It would depend on how much customization goes into it and how much satellite imagery is part of the deal. So right now we are working with a few uh, customers and uh, we really haven't reached a point where we are in the trial phase of things, so we haven't really reached a point where we can actually price uh, out the IU solution uh, to a finite number. Okay, and Jeff, if that doesn't answer the, your first question, let me know, and I could follow up. Um, let's see, we have lots of questions, good ones. All right. Um, is it possible for an organization with independent data, uh, for example, VMS, to use your platform? Absolutely. So this platform inside Explorer is uh, uh, the way we designed it is to work with variety of data. We already have vessel tracking data integrated into it and whatever kind of position information needs to come from any other VMS system it's very, very easy to integrate that data set. Okay, and I think that uh, answered this other question, which was, have you had any discussion of integrating RFMO and state-level VMS data? I don't know enough about this to know if it fully answered that question. Yeah, it, it kind of does, but okay. if, uh, if there is an opportunity, again, we are working with local uh, local fisheries authorities in different parts of the world, but if anybody in the audience has any opportunity uh, that they can think of where uh, integration of local state level VMS uh, data needs to be integrated into this platform along with oceanographic uh, data sets and AIS, uh, we'll be happy to do that work and work with them. Okay, and just for in case anyone's curious, I'm pretty sure RFMO is Regional Fisheries Management Organization, and VMS is Vessel Management System. I'm, am I right about those? Yeah. Yes, you are. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, question: What is the difference between this and Global Fishing Watch? Is this a crowdsourced platform? So. Um, Global Fishing Watch, which is a system that SkyTruth has uh, recently released, of course, uh, they just released the beta version, um, and that's in partnership with Oceana and Google. Um, so that is really a system where you can only see the hotspots of historic fishing activity. So you can select a time frame, and you can say, I want to see where the fishing activity has happened in the last one month, last three months, last six months, whatever time period you're interested in. You can select that time frame and see the hotspots and see which parts of the world actually had fishing activity in that time period. But what we are offering is a totally different set of uh, solutions. So one on one side, you have the AIS uh, data and the related analytics with it which is, of course, detecting 
uh, which vessel might be engaged in fishing. Uh, then the second level is predicting where activity might happen tomorrow and day after. So if you go back, Sky Truth or uh, uh, Global Fishing Watch is all past. What we are saying is, okay, not only can we do past, but we can kind of predict where activity is going to happen in the next couple of days as well. So it gives you a vision. Now, again, if you're going after vessels that are engaged in illegal activity, you want to be, uh, you want to have some time lag uh, in between the operation, right? You want to have some time to be able to uh, take some action. So if you know where the activity is going to happen tomorrow, and then on top, you have the ability to collect satellite imagery on that area, now that becomes a very, very powerful tool. So that's how uh, these are two completely uh, uh, different solutions. Okay. And Vipul, um, <clears throat> there was a, a request. Can you go back to the main interface slide so we can look at that while questions are being asked? Or can you uh, recommend the site we can go to so we can see and explore it for demonstrations? I guess that's really two questions, a request and a question. Okay, so uh, this slide, correct? Can you yes. see this slide? Yes. yes, yes, we can see that now. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, is there also any place they can go for to just play around with anything? So this particular platform is actually a localized, uh, or uh, it's actually installed on a local machine. So it's not a web-based platform. So if anyone in the audience is interested, we can start a trial. We can give you. Uh, free 30 days or whatever time frame you need to play with the platform and uh, see what need it might serve for you. So please reach out to uh, me, Allison, or Sarah, and we can set you up. Yes, and if anybody, uh, I, I think there was plenty of time to get Allison Vipple's information, but if you didn't, uh, you can always just uh, reply to me, Sarah Carr at the EBM tools at natureserve.org, where the webinar information came from, and I will forward you on to them. Okay. Uh, yes, you have several people who said they're definitely interested in a trial. Okay. Um, let's see. Still some good questions. Um, uh, have you had any interaction with the academic community on dynamic ocean management? Um, it has a similar objective in terms of predicting species distributions. You know, not really, and we would love to engage in that conversation. So I think Allison would be the right person uh, to do that. Uh, she's done a lot of research on different species and uh, patterns and all that. So absolutely, I think uh, for that, uh, if you can reach out to Allison, we would love to engage in that. OK, great. Um, can the system automatically identify fishing activity based on AIS tracks? So uh, this platform at the moment does not, but what we are doing at the moment is if there's a customer who is interested in uh, detecting the fishing activity based on the AIS tracks, our partners Exact Earth are running uh, those set of algorithms and what we do is we collect hotspots and we can serve those and overlay them on our platform. So, But eventually what we will do is we are uh, going to have those algorithms built into the Inside Explorer. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, is it usable in other parts of the world um, or only in Southeast Asia? I suspect based on the map, it's the answer is it is available in other places. But if you could just discuss like where all it is available. This is absolutely global uh, uh, system. So. We can serve any area in the world. We have every single data set that Allison listed across the globe, available across the globe. Okay. Um, are there any plans to deploy CubeSats? I read an interesting article recently in The Economist about low-cost swarms of CubeSats providing near real-time imagery. So uh, starting next year, we are looking to launch six CubeSats. I'm not really sure about the time frame, but one thing to notice about uh, CubeSats is the resolution is not going to be high enough. The What we have 
up in the uh, up in the space is really uh, high resolution high class satellites that will provide sub meter resolution so but that said we do have plan to to launch some with uh, uh, with a partner and i if i remember it was 2017 and towards the end of 2017 or 2018 but yes i agree there are a lot of companies uh, who are looking to launch cubesats a lot of them uh, to do real time imagery but uh, I haven't seen a system that would provide a true high res image, um, you know, any of those CubeSats. Okay, thank you, Pippa. Um, so this, uh, someone was describing their intended use, and I didn't know if that was anything you could uh, address or if you had any additional information for this person. Um, I'm interested in looking at vessels fishing in certain areas, for example, the EEZs of uh, uh, specific countries that have lots of seabird bycatch. Um, I'm looking to extract data including vessel names, flag, etc. from AIS data at certain times of year. Is this something that uh, this platform could do? Uh, so uh, if you are looking for data in raw format, you really, uh, you can use the platform as, as well, but in conjunction to the platform, what we could do is we could feed you with the raw data for those vessels. What we do is when we set up a customer for AIS deliveries, we uh, ask them to choose an area so they can define a polygon uh, with the coordinates and they will get AIS data for all the vessels in that polygon. So uh, you could get it in an Excel, uh, raw data in an XML format or um, any other format uh, that uh, would be uh, viable for this kind of data. We could probably work on that, but XML is something that we can easily do. Okay, thank you, Bip. Um Can you use SAR for real-time ship tracking? So. SAR is, uh, that's a really good question and a lot of people have, especially when it comes to IUU, uh, there's a lot of talk about using SAR data and uh, one, and we, our roadmap actually has planned to integrate SAR data, but the problem with SAR data, what we are facing right now is uh, the detection rate isn't very good, especially if you think about it, the international regulation is that every vessel above 300 uh, GRT needs to have AIS on at all times. If you are a smaller vessel, you are not required to, uh, to have AIS. So really the blind spots are with these small vessels which don't have AIS and these are typically smaller vessels and the detection rate for these vessels uh, using SAR imagery is really not that high so it's kind of uh, a balance and the price uh, or uh, the cost for SAR image uh, is really high so at some point in time you have to question the cost versus benefit uh, on sorimetry, so that's why we, we've kind of put it on the back burner, but uh, yes, we have considered and still considering integrating SAR imagery into the platform or into the mix of uh, solution at a future point. Okay, thank you, Vipul. And just to uh, warn people, we're getting down to the last couple questions that I currently have, so if you have more questions, go ahead and send them in now. Uh, let's see. I may have missed this, but how do you deal with situations regarding when AIS is turned off by a fishing, fishing vessel? Um, and they're specifically talking about IUU fishing. Yeah, so th there are two common problems that happens uh, that happen when uh, people, uh, you know, uh, with AIS data in particular. So one is, of course, like uh, one of the audience members said, turn off. AIS data, so if a vessel turns off the AIS data, that one's very easy to detect because what we do is in our system, we let you filter out the amount of tracks you want to see and which type of vessels and vessels by name. And you are able to see the whole track for, if you've been receiving data for a year, you can see the whole track. Uh, 
So if somebody turns off the AIS, it's really easy to detect because you'll see a gap in coverage. So if you, and even if you didn't, don't see a gap, what you'll see is you'll see a vessel which reported last position middle of the sea was 15 days ago. So what happened to the vessel? I mean, either the vessel was gone, which is highly unlikely, or they turned off the AIS, which is uh, normally the scenario. So you would know which vessel turned off the AIS. And uh, in this day and age, actually, authorities are very, very closely monitoring, especially the bigger vessels, uh, on which ones uh, regularly turn off the AIS. And in some areas, they actually find those vessels. And the second case is what uh, happens in a lot of cases as they spoof the uh, AIS uh, message. So what they do is they either uh, report the wrong position. So you would uh, have a vessel reporting in say Atlantic whereas the vessel uh, could be in Pacific. So they have ways to do that. But most of those cases we have some kind of a workaround where we can find their true position. Interesting. Okay. Um, so who is providing you with real-time imagery and products, or are you downloading and processing by your own in-house oceanographers that are getting data from NASA, NOAA, et cetera, and processing it in-house? For instance, how are you getting frontal data and strength? So, okay, uh, there were many parts to that question. Let me start with the data sets first. So when you say satellite imagery, there are many kinds of satellite imagery. So uh, if you're talking about chlorophyll, the which is plankton, and SST, that we are getting from NOAA and NASA. We, we have both feeds from MODIS and uh, uh, VIRS for both temperature and plankton. And we kind of merge them together or we uh, use one as the backup. Um, but the other data sets, li like satellite imagery, that's from our own satellites. Uh, you know, so the high resolution satellite imagery is from our own four satellites that Allison had listed in her presentation. Uh, but the processing of uh, the oceanographic data is done partly by us, partly by Naval Research Labs, so we have a contract with them and they do some custom processing for us. And again, we've, we've been in business since uh, 1997, so we've kind of fine-tuned our processing over the years and so far uh, we've seen it's, uh, it's been working very well. Okay, thank you, Vipal. And, yeah. and Matthew, okay, yeah, if you have additional follow-ups, uh, just in a minute. Um, let's see, are there other companies that offer similar IUU solutions? If so, is there anything that makes Digital Globe's approach unique or more effective? That's a, that's a great question. So there are many players now, especially in the last one year, there are so many small people coming to the arena and providing some kind of solution to uh, combat IUU. So uh, I can name a few and I can tell you what the advantages are uh, that we offer. So SkyTruth, or rather I should say Global Fishing Watch is one, which is of course a free, uh, uh, free platform which anyone really in the public can sign up and see where the fishing activity is happening. But if you think about it, it's a free platform and it just tells you where the fishing activity is happening. So the reason they put out that platform for public is because they're trying to create an awareness that if you can see uh, an area around the world which for years uh, at a stretch is having high fishing activity, that means most likely that areas being overfished. So they are trying to create an awareness with their platform. So they are one of the players in the arena. Then you have, I don't know if audience have heard about Catapult. So Catapult has something similar uh, like um, uh, Global Fishing Watch, where they have a platform with the AIS data and they detect fishing is behavior. Is that Project Eyes on the Sea? Exactly. That's okay. exactly what it is, yes. So, uh, 
what they do is they, in addition to their platform, they provide something which is called a compliance report. So they would go into a country and uh, say, okay, every week or every few days, we can provide you a report of activity in your uh, in your EEZ. And if there are any transshipments or whatever uh, activity you are interested in, we could point that out and we can highlight that and uh, give you a compliance report every uh, few days. And we are offering everything that SkyTruth is doing and Catapult is doing because we, uh, with our partner is Exactor and another company, we can do compliance reports as well as monitoring based on AIS tracks. And then, in addition, what we are offering, and this is where it can get very interesting, is using oceanographic data to predict where the activity will happen tomorrow. Again, uh, the Global Fishing Watch and Catapult, it's all about past. What we are offering is we are going a little bit beyond the past and saying, we can do hot spots and tell you where the activity might happen tomorrow and day after. And then uh, the, the third piece is the satellite imagery. And I, if you saw the Pulitzer Prize that AP got on catching that Thai vessel, now we, as I was saying earlier, we are doing an experiment trying to capture some transshipments. Now this could be a key piece. If you think about it, a lot of companies can do satellite imagery, a lot of companies can do AIS tracking and monitoring, and a lot of companies can do probably, I don't know, a whole lot of companies that have a platform to monitor oceanographic data. But we, I feel, are the only ones who can do all three. Okay, uh, that uh, was our last question. That was a great way to wrap up. Uh, Vipul and Allison, thank you so much. Um, this is a fascinating uh, presentation and, and, and questions and answers. And thank you to everyone uh, who was able to attend and send in questions. Um, uh, we uh, really appreciate you guys being on, and we hope uh, everyone is able to attend future webinars. And Vipul and Allison, yeah, this was absolutely fascinating. We're, we're glad you could do it. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone, and good morning if you're on the other side of the world. And uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot okay. for joining, and sorry for the technical problems. Okay. Oh, we surmounted. Okay. All right. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>